Um, well, good morning from uh, the Pacific uh, Coast here, and um, good day, and maybe good evening to the rest of the people in the world. Um, so thank you for tuning in uh, for our Grand Rounds for Health for the World. And uh, my name is Sylvia Chang. I'm from the University of um, British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. I'm uh, the moderating for this session, um, so I'm very pleased to moderate and a pleasure to introduce our speaker. And our speaker today is uh, Dr. Alexander O'Ferlan, who's Associate Professor in the Department of Radiology in the Abdominal Imaging Section at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. And uh, he's going to speak on imaging of cirrhosis. So I encourage you all to have your questions and enter them in the Q&A. And at the end of uh, Dr. Furland's lecture, we'll have a Q&A session. So without any uh, further delay, we have Dr. Furland who's going to speak on imaging of cirrhosis. Well, thank you, Sylvia, for the kind of introduction. And uh, thank you again for the opportunity of uh, being here virtually with you today. I truly admire the, 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 the scope and the, of the organization and uh, being part of this just for uh, a little bit makes me very proud. So thank you very much for, uh, for this opportunity. As Dr. Chang mentioned, I'm uh, transmitting from, uh, from Pittsburgh, uh, Eastern, uh, Western Pennsylvania. And um, so again, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening to, every, to all of you. Um, today, in the next uh, 40 minutes or so, we'll review cirrhosis. And so we review the imaging manifestation of cirrhosis. We'll touch base on uh, elastography and the role that this technique has nowadays in the management of patients with hepatic fibrosis. And uh, in the second part of the talk, uh, we'll uh, uh, review the role of imaging in patients at risk for hepatocellular carcinoma. So why cirrhosis? Why are we talking about cirrhosis? Because unfortunately, it is a common cause of morbidity and mortality across the globe, not only in the United States. Um, it, is, it represents the end stage of liver disease and when the hepatic parenchyma is completely replaced by bands of fibrosis and regenerative nodules. It's a cause of morbidity and mortality because, of course, it um, uh, comes with uh, uh, decrease or uh, liver function, but also because uh, it is an inc a risk factor for the development of malignancy, especially hepatocellular carcinoma. There are multiple causes of cirrhosis, and the etiology, the prevalence of etiology, really depends on your geographic area and where, where you're working. Where I work in Western Pennsylvania, in general in the United States, uh, the number one cause of chronic liver disease nowadays is uh, metabolic, is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or metabolic associated fatty liver disease. And in general, common causes are viral hepatitis uh, and uh, toxic um, causes such as uh, an excess of uh, alcohol intake. So why are radiologists talking to you about cirrhosis? Because as radiologists, as imagers, we play an important role in the clinical team managing these patients. We are often the first to provide a diagnosis of cirrhosis, or to suggest a diagnosis of cirrhosis. And uh, we play a significant role in the screening, diagnosis, and sometimes treatment of tumor arising in the setting of cirrhosis. So that's what we're going to discuss in the next uh, um, 40 minutes or so. The first part would be on how we diagnose cirrhosis and fibrosis. And on the second part, we'll talk about how we diagnose hepatocellular carcinoma in a cirrhotic liver. So cirrhosis is the end stage of uh, a transform an architectural transformation of the liver that comes uh, via accumulation of fibrosis. There are several um, uh, staging systems for fibrosis, but the one that is probably mostly used uh, is the Metavir score. In the Metavir score, any grade of fibrosis above three is, uh, indicates an adv advanced stage of fibrosis, and F4 corresponds to cirrhosis. 
Biopsy is still the gold standard, right? Sticking a needle into, into the liver and getting the, the, the specimen to the pathology is still the gold standard to diagnose fibrosis and to quantify the amount of fibrosis. But we all know in this uh, uh, conference today that it comes with limitations and it's costly. Most importantly, is an invasive procedure that is associated with a small but existing rate of complications and it causes pain and anxiety in the patient. That's why as imager, we play more and more in an important role in um, detecting fibrosis and quantifying fibrosis. We initially mostly rely on morphologic changes of the liver. And again, as the amount of fibrosis in the liver increases, the morphology of the liver changes. And uh, the, the, the margins become nodular, and the distribution of volume changes as well. So the right hepatic lobe tend to decrease in volume while the left and the caudate lobe tend to increase in volume. Although the distribution of volumes may depend on the etiology of the liver disease. Other signs that we commonly see in patients with uh, advanced uh, liver disease or cirrhosis uh, are um, a retraction of the surface, especially in area of uh, um, heavy fibrosis deposit, an expansion of the perihilar space, and an expansion of the gallbladder fossa. The most specific sign that we have to suggest the presence of cirrhosis on a CT or MRI is the coded to right low ratio. Is a number that you can come up by tracing a couple of lines on the axial CT image obtained at the level of the bifurcation of the right portal vein. So I usually use the portal venous phase images. I scroll down until I find the portal vein. I follow into the right portal vein, and then I find the bifurcation, and I stop there and start tracing a couple of lines. As the, I trace a vertical line along the medial border of the caudate lobe, a vertical line along the bifurcation of the right portal vein, and a vertical line along the lateral margin of the right hepatic lobe. And then you measure the distance between those lines. That is a representation of the size of the coded lobe and of the right hepatic lobe. In general, as the liver becomes more and more fibrotic, the caudate lobe tends to enlarge, whereas the right hepatic lobe tends to become more and more atrophic. And so a ratio between caudate and right hepatic lobe more than 1.1 has been shown to be very specific for cirrhosis. You'll notice from, uh, from the numbers down in, in the left lower co uh, corner there that although the specificity is high, the sensitivity of this sign is small. We'll come back to this concept in a couple of slides. Other signs that we rely on to suggest the presence of cirrhosis are, are the right hepatic notch sign. You see um, between the uh, right hepatic lobe and the right kidney, and then the expansion of the gallbladder fossa. When you use ultrasound, and ultrasound often is the first imaging modality in this patient, we rely on similar signs, so surface nodularity, the hypertrophy of the coded lobe, where we can actually identify it, and then the ecotexture of the quality of the ecotexture of the liver, which as the fibrosis increases, becomes more and more heterogeneous to the point that it becomes coarse. Of course, signs in, on a Doppler imaging may also help, such as the a monophasic or biphasic hepatic venous flow. When we look at how we perform as imagers in calling cirrhosis using these signs, you see from this table that our specificity is very high, meaning that when we see these signs, we are most of the time correct in diagnosing cirrhosis. There are some mimickers, it's true, but usually we can identify the mimickers based on the clinical history of the patient. But what is, is important to notice here is that the sensitivity of these signs is relatively low. And what that means is that a patient may have advanced fibrosis in his liver that has not yet caused 
a change in morphology or a change in architecture such as trans such as we don't necessarily perceive it on a cross-sectional image. Like if I show you these two cases, right? These are axial images from two different uh, patients. I guess there, there are no questions in the audience on which of them is serotic. We can all agree that the patient on your left here, the 65-year-old man with alcohol abuse, is the serotic patient. But what if I show you these two images here? The two patients, again, young, young individuals, a 35-year-old woman with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and a 40-year-old man with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. To me, those livers look pretty much the same and they don't look cirrhotic. But I can assure you that one of them has advanced fibrosis at pathology, at biopsy. I'll give you the solution at the end of this section. Hold with me here for a few minutes. Because in 2021, we don't rely only on morphologic changes to determine if a patient has advanced hepatic fibrosis or cirrhosis. We have a number of imaging techniques that have been developed and researched over the last 20 years or so. And among them, the one technique that made the leap from research into clinical practice is elastography. Elastography is a non-invasive assessment of the stiffness or elasticity of an organ. And we do that by measuring the degree of transformation of a tissue, in, in this case, the liver parenchyma, in response to a mechanical st stimulus. The assumption here, which has been proven by multiple studies now, is that as the amount of fibrosis increases, so does the stiffness of the organ. And so by measuring the stiffness of the organ, we hope we can assess non-invasively the amount of fibrosis in the liver. There are several te elastography techniques available. The ones mostly used in clinical practice include the ultrasound-based techniques, such as vibration control transient elastography, commercially, this technique is sold as FibroScan. It is the very, very first elastography technique introduced in the market. In the United States, that is not under the radiology umbrella. It's managed by our hepatologist because it's truly not an imaging-based technique. And then we have shear wave elastography techniques, ultrasound-based imaging, and that is managed by us. And on the other end, we have elastography based on MRI, MRI-based elastography. This technique was developed in Mayo more than 10 years ago and now commercially available. On ultrasound, when we use shear wave elastography, what we are doing, we are measuring the speed of propagation of shear waves. Shear waves are relatively slow waves that generates in the tissue, in this case, in the liver parenchyma, after the propagation of the compression wave. And, they are, and they, their direction is perpendicular to the propagation of the compression wave. The systems are now developed to the way that, and I know I'm making this in a way simple, but just to carry, to bring home the message here, what the systems are doing are measuring the speed of propagation of the shear waves and then apply the young or to translate that speed of propagation into stiffness of the organ. And that's how we assess uh, the elasticity or the stiffness of the organ using ultrasound. The commercially available techniques using this principle um, have software that can provide you either point shear wave elastography or 2D shear wave elastography. Both of them are RFI techniques. So both of them are based on a, an acoustic radiation frequency impulse. In point shear wave elastography, we have just one of them, which creates shear waves in a very small region of interest in the liver. 
That's why it's called point Schubert stop. This system does not provide you an elasticity map, but gives you a value of stiffness in that particular point of the liver. The evolution of this system is the 2D shear wave elastography, where we use multiple RF pulse pushes to create, uh, uh, to explore a larger region of the hepatic parenchyma. And so the system allows us to obtain elasticity maps, color coded elastograms that are superimposed on the grayscale images. So we are able to explore a larger portion of the brain. But the principle is the same. We measure multiple times the same area, usually about 10 times, and then we calculate the median value. And that's what we are reporting. And that's what we use as an estimate of uh, stiffness and what correlates with the amount of fibrosis. As you can see from, from this slide, the row the, uh, the row of images on top is grayscale imaging in patients with different degree of fibrosis, whereas the is, in patient, is the, the same patients, but with superimposed elastogram. Now, the changes in grayscale as the amount of fibrosis increases are minimal. All of these patients that I'm showing here are patients with non-alcoholic fat liver disease. We notice in this patient that the morphologic changes may not be so um, conspicuous as the amount of fibrosis increases. And we believe that the amount of fat in the liver may play a role there. But on the bottom row, you see how the color within the elastogram tends to become more warm in a way. So it translates from blue to yellow and then orange and red as the amount of fibrosis increases. We um, follow the recommendation of the Society of Radiologists in Ultrasound for acquiring the imaging and also for reporting the values that we obtain out of the images. This document has been updated only a few months ago and is available in the radiology website. According to these guidelines, any value above 13 kilopascal rule in advanced chronic liver disease, which implies a level of fibrosis that is at least F3 or F4. And values below 5 kilopascal are normal, are indicative of a normal liver. And so in, when uh, we report our, the, the, our stiffness values, um, this is what we use in, at, the, at, the bottom, at the bottom of our report. Now, on the other end, we do elastography also using MRI. Um, you need a combination of hardware and software to run elastography on your MR scan. The hardware is made of an external driver or active driver. This sits outside of the MRI scanner room and is connected via a vacuum tube to a passive driver. And the passive driver, you can picture it as a speaker in a way, as a, um, an oval shape disc that is placed between the circus coil and the gown of the patient in the right upper quadrant, usually along the uh, lower portion of the uh, right anterior chest wall. So what happens here is that the waves, the sonic waves are originating in the external driver, mechanical waves are originating in the external driver, propagated through the tube to the passive driver. The passive driver vibrates and by vibrating transmits the waves into the liver. So what you need next, needs next is a, a sequence that can image the propagation of the waves. And so what we have in our institution is a 2D gradient echo sequence. This is the original sequence that uh, um, was developed for MR elastography. It's not the only one at this time, but it's the one most commonly available. It's a gradient echo sequence with embedded motion encoded gradients 
that are able to translate the waves, the motion of the waves into, um, into an image. These are the acquisition image, and then the system via a proprietary inversion algorithm will uh, transform those acquired images into quantitative maps. And those quantitative maps that comes in different flavor, colors, and uh, grayscale are labeled as elastographs. We are able then to trace a region of interest in the elastogram and get a value of stiffness of the loop. And as expected, as the amount of fibrosis in the liver increases, and as the, the liver become more and more stiff, this is depicted by MRI and translates into color-coded uh, elastograms that show more and more warm colors. When I teach this to, to our fellows, I tell them that the blue liver, at least on imaging, is a good liver, whereas a red liver is a bad liver. And actually, this is a concept that our hepatologists use when they see the patients in clinic. They like to show them the color-coded elastograms because leveraging on the power of imaging and on the effect that they can have on the patient who can perhaps a patient with fatty liver disease who has a chance to modify the amount of fibrosis in his liver by modifying the diet or following a particular therapeutic recommendation, showing a picture of an altered color instead of the normal blue, I've been told as a, as a significant effect on the patient. These are, um, for, for um, uh, reporting, we use the uh, a scale that was developed at the Mayo Clinic and is available online. And here, the values are not exactly the same as the one reported with ultrasound elastography, although they correlate. And here, a value above 4, 4.5 kilopascal usually denotes a high level of fibrosis, advanced liver fibrosis. Elastography works pretty well in the setting of fibrosis. The accuracy is high, especially for the detection of advanced fibrosis. And especially the negative predictive value, so the ability of the test to rule out the presence of advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis is very high. And because of that, the current recommend, national recommendations uh, for the management of patients with hepatic fibrosis and cirrhosis include elastography. And the main recommendation is to use it for detecting and ruling out uh, advanced fibrosis and, and cirrhosis. So let's go back to the case I showed you a few minutes ago. Two young patients with uh, fatty liver and one of them with uh, um, advanced fibrosis. Cannot tell using just the conventional morphologic findings. There is no nodularity of the liver. There is no alteration of the volume distribution. But those patients were scanned in a scanner with available uh, elastography. And so we ran an elastogram here. And you can see how the colors of the maps are different. The one on the right definitely has warmer colors than the one on the left. And actually, when you trace the region of interest, uh, you get values that are significantly different. 4.4 kilopascal for the 40-year-old man and 2.5 kilopascal for the 35-year-old female. We biopsy both these livers. This was at the beginning of our experience. And the patient on the right has indeed a high level of fibrosis as suggested by the elastic. So in this first portion of the, of the talk, I hope I was able to show you what, is, what are the conventional imaging features of cirrhosis. And now we can use in a daily practice elastography to increase our confidence in calling advanced liver disease and also our accuracy. Now in the next portion of the talk, so in the next 20 minutes, We'll focus more on hepatocellular carcinoma 
And the reason why we're doing this is because patients with cirrhosis have an increased risk of developing cancer. And among all the cancers that can arise in a cirrhotic liver, the most common one is HCC. Not only, more than 95% of the HCCs originates in the setting of cirrhosis. Unfortunately, this cancer is not uncommon, it's a very common cancer, and the incidence of this tumor truly depends, again, on where you live, but in the United States uh, is, uh, is relatively high, not as high as in the uh, Far East uh, Asian country, but still moderately high. And unfortunately, that incidence is increasing over time. Hepatocellular uh, carcinoma in the United States is currently recognized as the most rapidly escalating cause of cancer mortality. There are several reasons for this, or, suggest, or hypothesis. One of them, for sure, is the increased prevalence of uh, uh, incidence of uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And, uh, um, as a potential, potential explanation. As a radiologist, uh, we play a key role in the management of patients at risk or with hepatocellular carcinoma. Surveillance, screening, diagnosis, and also in treatment. So we screen patients with cirrhosis for hepatocellular carcinoma because they have a high risk of developing, uh, developing cancer, right? That risk is anywhere between two and 8% per year, and truly depends on uh, the etiology being you know, variable and uh, depending on if the etiology of the disease is viral or metabolic or alcoholic. Surveillance of hepatocellular carcinoma is nowadays mostly performed using ultrasound. These patients undergo um, every six months, an ultrasound of the right upper quadrant to detect, to find lesions. Um, we use ultrasound, although we recognize the ultrasound as limitations. And the sensitivity, specifically the sensitivity of the technique is variable as reported in the literature. And we know it decreases significantly in patients with a large BMI or with a significant amount of fat in their liver. It's also operator dependent and that introduces another potential limitation. But we still use ultrasound because of, mainly because of a ratio between benefit and cost. There is more and more work done in multiple academic centers in using an abbreviated MRI for replacing ultrasound, especially in the, in the screening setting, especially in a population where we predict the ultrasound could be of poor quality, like again, patients with a large BMI. But this is still under investigation and uh, implemented clinically, to my knowledge, only in a few centers. Now, when you find something at screening on ultrasound, you don't stop there. And you don't try to characterize it necessarily on ultrasound, unless that lesion you find has a, a pathognomonic clinical, uh, but a cl classic features for a benign entity, like a cyst, for example. Otherwise, if you find a solid lesion, depending on the size of the lesion, the management will change. If the lesion is at least one centimeter in size, you send the patient to do a contrast announced multiphasic CT or MRI to characterize that lesion and to give that lesion a risk of malignancy. If the lesion is less than one centimeter, the current recommendations and those that we follow in the United States are from the American Association of the Study of Liver Disease, suggest to send the patient back to ultrasound but using a shorter interval time this time, like about three months, um, to check for growth, with the idea that those small lesions are very difficult to characterize on CT or MRI. And if it's negative, you just send the patient back for a, um, a follow-up uh, uh, ultrasound in six months. 
we, as radiologists, of course, we play a key role in the diagnosis of hepatocellular carcinoma. And that's where I'm gonna spend most of the time um, in the next few slides. Today, I'm not gonna to touch base on the role that we play in the treatment of hepatocellular carcinoma, although it is very important, um, but um, you can find that information certainly in, in, in other lectures. We play an important role in diagnosis because Again, biopsying a lesion in cirrhosis has a number of limitations. We have a significant number of false positive when we try to do that, to the point that we need to repeat the biopsy up to 16, 20% of the time. We also have to consider, again, the uh, potential for risks, and uh, those are like bleeding and uh, tumor seeding. For, for example, although tumor seeding seems to be less uh, of a risk than what initially thought. But because of the limitation of biopsy, because of the very high pre-test probability of having a cellular carcinoma in the setting of cirrhosis, and because of we have, as, we'll, as I'll show you later, very stringent criteria that provide a very high specificity for the diagnosis of the cellular carcinoma, we can now provide a confident and accurate diagnosis of HCC based on imaging, most of the time without the need for biopsy. So in order to understand the imaging appearance of hepatocellular carcinoma, we need to understand a little bit, we need to review quickly the hepatocarcinogenesis in cirrhosis. So the process that leads a cirrhotic nodule progressively to become an hepatocellular carcinoma. Now, in a very simplified approach, what happens is that that nodule over time will lose the portal venous supply. And that because, that's because the number of portal venous triad in the nodules becomes smaller and smaller. And so because of that, also the original arterial supply to the nodule tend to decrease. On the other hand, progressively in this uh, new angiogenetic process, in, the, in this hepatocarcinogenetic process, you have new angiogenesis. So you have more new and disorganized arterial blood vessels in the nodule that is progressively becoming a tumor. That neoangiogenesis is responsible for one of the key imaging features of hepatocellular carcinoma, which is arterial phase hyperenhancement, defined as unequivocal hyperenhancement of the mass the lesion compared to the surrounding liver parenchyma during the arterial phase. Now, most HCC, if you give it some time, so if you scan again in the portal venous or the late phase, will show, will, will show another specific, highly specific imaging feature, which is called washout. And by washout, we define the decrease in enhancement from an earlier to a later phase, resulting in lesion hypoenhancement on the portal venous phase images. Now, when you put those two together, arterial phase hyperenhancement and washout, in the setting of cirrhosis, the accuracy, especially the specificity of this sign, because this combination of signs for the diagnosis of hepatocellular carcinoma is so high that in all imaging guidelines across the globe, this combination of findings, again, in the setting of cirrhosis, is considered diagnostic for hepatocellular carcinoma. The specificity indeed is very high and reaches almost, is above 95% for lesions that are larger than two centimeters. It has to be in the setting of cirrhosis. Now, in the setting of cirrhosis, you don't have only hepatocellular carcinomas or 
you don't have only about cellular carcinomas that present with a typical imaging appearance. You have a number of nodules. And so how, we, how do we communicate the relative risk of malignancies of these nodules to the clinical field? We can use a narrative form, of course, but nowadays we have a dictionary. We have a lexicon and we have a language. And that language, if you allow me the, um, the, the comparison here, is LIRADS, is Liver Imaging Reporting and Data System. This system was developed now more than 10 years ago to standardize the terminology, interpretation, and reporting of lesions that occur in a patient at increased risk for a cellular carcinoma. And so to our cirrhotic patient that we are discussing today. And the overarching goal of this system is to improve the communication with the clinical team. Before LIRADS, we used to describe nodules with narrative terms. And the risk was, uh, as I'm showing you in this slide, that the same lesion scan at different imaging time with the same appearance would be described with different terms by different radiologists. This has been shown in a, in a, in a recent publication by Dr. Corwin, showing indeed that we use uh, uh, similar terms for uh, describing lesions with different risk of malignancies or different terms for describing lesions with the same risk of malignancy. And that's why LIRADS was introduced. LIRADS now in 2021 has four algorithms, one for surveillance, two for diagnosis, and one for post-treatment. And today we'll focus on the diagnostic algorithm for CT and MRI, which is the first one being developed. In this algorithm, using a combination of major imaging features, ancillary features, and an algorithm, we can classify each observation or lesion in the liver into one of eight um, um, categories and that range from LIRATS-1 being benign to LIRATS-5 being definitely hepatocellular carcinoma. There is now a large amount of literature that look at the uh, value of LIRATS, and as proven in this recent uh, meta-analysis, as the uh, LIRATS category increases, so does the risk of or the probability of hepatocellular carcinoma. To a point that a LIRATS-5 category, which is defined as definitely hepatocellular carcinoma, has almost 100% specificity for HCC. And this is very important from, for the management of the patient, because when we classify a lesion in a cirrhotic liver as LIRATS-5, the lesion is then treated without need for path confirmation. Or if you work in a transplant center, depending on the system that is used, but the, the information that you provide as a radiologist can be used to um, add uh, points to the waiting list in the, in, to, the, to the patient and in, in, in the waiting list for, 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 for an organ. And so again, it allows this combination of image, recognizing this combination of imaging features allows to provide a non-invasive diagnosis, a non-invasive and confident diagnosis of cellular carcinoma without the need for virus. So how does it work? Let me, let me guide you through quickly a couple of examples and so we can all become familiar with the basics of LIRADS. The first thing you have to do is to select the correct population. LIRADS applies only to patients at high risk for HCC, and those being patients with cirrhosis, chronic hepatitis B, or with a prior history of hepatocellular carcinoma. As you scroll through the images of a cirrhotic liver, you find a lesion, an observation. LIRATS uh, prefers the term observation rather than lesion. And so 
as you find the observation, you pull up the LIRATS algorithm. And the one I'm showing you today is the latest version, version 2018. And as you can see, this algorithm is made of two portions. There is an upper portion, which is the diagnostic tree, and a lower portion that is the, the algorithm itself. So you start from the top, you start from the diagnostic tree. And it's helpful to start from the diagnostic tree because if you find imaging features that are specific, you can uh, assign that observation and that lesion directly a LIRATS category without going through the algorithm. And so if you find uh, um, tumor in vein, which is defined as uh, soft enhancing soft tissue in the vessel, that lesion, that mass, would be assigned directly the observation TIV, LIRATS TIV, without going to the algorithm. Tumor in vein, again, is, of course, a malignant finding and is defined as enhancing soft tissue expanding a vessel, most commonly branches of the portal vein. And this has been proven, of course, to be a malignant uh, finding most commonly associated with hepatocellular carcinoma, but not only. You can have other malignancies in the liver giving you tumor in vein. If you find a cyst, you don't, know, you don't need to go to the algorithm. You just uh, assign a LIRATS 1 or 2 category to the cyst, and then you are done. And finally, you'll find, uh, although those are not the most common observation, but in cirrhosis, sometimes you'll find uh, lesions that look malignant, but they are not, uh, their the imaging appearance is not typical for hepatocellular carcinoma. And those are usually lesions with uh, a targetoid appearance, so with a rim enhancement, for example. You assign this, when you find those features, you will assign them the LIRATS M category, which stands for malignancy, which stands, and is intended to include lesions at a higher risk of being malignant, but without. Uh, specific imaging appearance of hepatocellular carcinoma. Now, in this group, we'll find uh, um, the intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, for example. We'll find the combined cholangiocarcinoma and hepatocellular carcinoma. But we'll also find a small uh, percentage of hepatocellular carcinoma, which just don't follow the book and follow like a I have a different imaging presentation. When you exclude when you go through the diagnostic tree and the observation you found does not really match any of the entries in the diagnostic tree, then you walk into the algorithm. Then you pick up the CT-MR diagnostic table. Now, that table allows you to assign the observation either a LIRAT 3, 4, or 5 category based on a combination of major features, size, and, uh, um, and major features and size. And those major features including arterial phase hyper enhancement, washout, capsule, and growth. So let me show you an example. We have a MRI here, multiphasic MRI performed with a, a prevalently extracellular contrast agent. And um, you found a lesion and, um, in the right hepatic lobe. The lesion does not fit any of the entry in the diagnostic in the diagnostic tree, so you move into the uh, diagnostic table, the algorithm itself. So, first of all, we notice in the arterial phase that the lesion is uh, hyper enhancing on the arterial phase, and so we can black out, white out in this case, the columns relative to the hypo enhancing lesions. We then are going to measure the lesion, which measures more than two centimeters. So that will essentially uh, allow us to work only in one column of that table, the far right column of the table. And you can see like that lesion is either a four or a five, and that really depends on how many major features we can find. Well, it happens that this patient has washout on the portal venous phase and also show a capsule on the delayed phase. So two features, that makes a LIRATS-5 lesion. So we're going to call this LIRATS-5. So we are going to call, make a confident call of hepatocellular carcinoma. What about this other lesion right there? 
smaller, right? But still, alpha phase I pronounce. It measures 16 millimeter. So we are in between, you are in the column of arterial phase hyperenanse lesion measuring between one and two centimeters. And uh, it looks like there is washout, but no caps. And so by using the system, you identify one cell of that table, which, is, which has a diagonal line in it. And in that cell, you have observation that are either lyrates four or five. And you choose between a four or five, depending on what kind of uh, major feature is present in lesions with uh, washout or fresh on growth you label it that as lyrat five whereas in lesion only with capsule you label that as lyrat four so in our, in our case we have washout and so this 1.6 centimeter lesion with a period phase hyperenhancement will be labeled as a LIRAT5. So the diagnostic for about several weeks. You're not done yet. There are other features in the LIRATS algorithm and, and particularly the ancillary features. This is, this is a number of uh, um, minor features that can be used to adjust the category of risk of a lesion. You have lesion favoring malignancy that allow you to move the category of risk of one step at a time, but up to a LIRAT4. You cannot make the jump from a four to a five. And then you have a number of uh, benign features that on the other end allow you to adjust the category on the other direction and move the category down, scale down by one step at a time. So this is an example of how we use a, a ancillary features. This is an MRI obtained with uh, um, getting your DPA, so it's an hepatobiliary contrast agent. And again, small lesion in the hepatic dome showing arterial phase hyperenhancement, but without washout. Originally, we labeled this as a LIRAT3 lesion. But because of the hypointensity of the lesion of the hepatobiliary phase, which is an ancillary feature suggestive of malignancy, we were able to upgrade this lesion to a LIRATS4. And this actually turned out to be an hepatocellular carcinoma at expert. So our life as a dominant imager changed with the introduction of LIRATS. We don't describe this lesion in a narrative form anymore. We use the terms of LIRATS, and we also tend to include those terms in a structured approach. But we are not the only members of the clinical team using this language. Our hepatologists and surgeons in our centers all adopted this terminology when we discussed the cases in the multidisciplinary tumor boards. You can find everything you need to know and more about LIRATS in the ACR website. The manual has been published a couple of years ago. It's a comprehensive manual of more than 600 pages, I think. You can download it entirely if you want, or just chapters at a time for free in the ACR website. So in conclusion, I hope that in the last 40 minutes or so, I was able to summarize for you the morphologic imaging findings of cirrhosis, the role photography plays in the management of these patients nowadays, and also the value of LIRATS for um, the uh, description and reporting of uh, imaging findings in patients at increased risk for hepatocellular carcinoma. Keeping in mind again that when you assign a LIRATS 5 to a lesion in cirrhosis, you significantly uh, provide an input to the team as uh, those lesions are usually managed without the need of a biopsy. And with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention and time today. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you again. That's great. Thank you, Dr. Ferland. That was an amazing lecture on uh, cirrhosis and a great turnout from all over the world. We're going to um, start the um, Q&A session now. And we do have a session uh, question from one of the panelists, um, which is, uh, which is the best study, MR 
MRI or elastography. Best study, I guess, for uh, um, for this diagnosis of cirrhosis, I guess, or uh, advanced liver disease. Um, so if you compare, um, you know, we know that elastography, when, when adding elastography to a cross-sectional imaging study, you increase uh, sensitivity and specific, you increase your accuracy in calling, uh, um, especially advanced liver fibrosis. Uh, which elastography method is best? Um, uh, that's a very good question and a very difficult one to answer. It looks like it may depend on the etiology of liver disease. Um, in general, MRE, MR-based elastography is more robust than ultrasound-based elastography and provides uh, a higher inter-observer agreement. Um, ultrasound-based elastography is still an ultrasound-based technique, so it's uh, operator-dependent, uh, and it has a number of limitations that would limit the quality of an ultrasound studies, like, again, large BMI and so on. But so the but what we can say is that for advanced liver disease, for advanced liver fibrosis, they both perform very well. And so it's difficult to compare them because the, the performance of both is very high. Um, in our institution, what we do uh, with most of our ultrasound, uh, most of our elastography is ultrasound based. And we tend to do MR based elastography when uh, uh, ultrasound-based elastography is limited, or when a patient had to undergo MRI for another reason. Okay. I hope this answers the question. And uh, we have another question. It's with regards to hepatobiliary specific agents. Is it obligatory, necessary to use hepatospecific agent as a contrast agent? Uh, that's another very good question. Uh, a short answer to that question, in my opinion, and uh, is is no. Um, there is uh, a lot of debate uh, um, in the in the in the bubble of abdominal imaging on uh, what is the best uh, gadolinium-based contrast agent to use uh, in patients with cirrhosis, and um, the answer truly is debatable and depends a lot on your experience, the experience of your institution. And, um, uh, and, and, and a number of, of, other, of other factors. But certainly having an hepatobiliary contrast agent available at least in your institution will help. Uh, but I don't think it's mandatory to be used. Uh, the advantage of the hepatobiliary contrast agent, of course, is that you have the hepatobiliary phase. The hepatobiliary phase provides an additional set of information for characterizing the lesion. But using a purely extra, uh, using um, EOBDTPA, for example, um, gatoxetated sodium may be challenging sometimes. Um, we noticed you know, an increased uh, frequency of, um, of motion artifact during the dynamic state, that dynamic study that can compromise significantly the quality. We know that the, um, an extracellular contrast agent, or uh, no, contrast agent with prevalently, prevalently extracellular, uh, provides a more uh, robust uh, dynamic study compared to an hepatobiliary contrast agent. Again, this is debated, but I don't think it's mandatory to use uh, an hepatobiliary contrast agent in the setting of cirrhosis. And indeed, when you follow the guidelines, uh, it's either um, this, uh, there, is, there is no mandate in that direction. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is, how do you differentiate between cirrhosis and diffuse hepatocellular carcinoma with cirrhosis? Yeah, very good question. Thank you for asking that. Diffuse hepatocellular carcinoma can be very difficult to diagnose, especially on ultrasound and CT. Um, for the other members of the chat here, what we mean by diffuse hepatocellular carcinoma is uh, a relatively rare presentation of the cancer where multiple uh, tumor, small size tumor nodules are spread throughout uh, a large portion of the liver. 
the problem with that when you inject contrast is that you don't have a well circumscribed mass announcing you have announcement of these nodules that are again uh, spread out throughout the liver parenchyma and so even on ct it may be difficult to detect what i find most uh, helpful on ct when present is uh, recognizing the invasion of the vessels so the tumor in vein, which unfortunately often occurs in patients with diffuse hepatocellular carcinoma. On ultrasound, uh, truly you have to pay attention to the heterogeneity of the parenchyma, like severe focal heterogeneity of the hepatic parenchyma, even in the setting of cirrhosis, uh, is concerning. And when you have a doubt on ultrasound and CT, suggest an MRI, not necessarily for the dynamic study, but for uh, the, the most informative sequences in that particular situation are tissue-weighted imaging and diffusion-weighted imaging, at least in my experience. On tissue-weighted imaging, you would see the tumor as uh, mildly hyperintense compared to the normal liver parenchyma that is relatively hypo. And then on diffusion-weighted imaging, the tumor, even those small nodules will, will appear as bright. Um, the hepatobiliary phase helps as well, as long as there is enough function in the liver to accumulate uh, the, uh, the hepatobiliary contrastation into normal functioning hepatocytes. That is a very difficult one to diagnose solution and to manage. Okay, great. So we have um, quite a few questions. Um, just to kind of keep it in line with that topic, you talked about DWI. There was another question about how it's not included in LIRADS and does it not provide additional information? It sounds like you've already you know, show that this this sort of in circumstance of diffuse liver um, HDC can be helpful. Um, can you maybe um, expand on that question a little bit more about um, when you would use DWI? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, DWI in LIRATS is a, an ancillary feature. Um, so it's a feature favoring malignancy, uh, especially when there is severe recent diffusion, but it did not make it to the major feature. And the reason for that is because uh, Again, the, the value of sensitivity associated with uh, restricted diffusion in the setting of cirrhosis, uh, uh, they're not that high. Although we have it in our uh, protocol and um, I use it all the time and I, I make sure that before I close the study, I always look at the diffusion weighted imaging. And I prevalently, in, a, in the setting of cirrhosis, I use it for detection. So I use it to actually identify a lesion. And then I will look at the dynamic study to characterize that lesion. Okay, great. And then just kind of moving along the lines of kind of LIRADS and the tumor in vein, which you also talked about before. Someone went asking a question to clarify the significance of tumor in vein observation in LIRADS category. Is observation characterized as LIRADS 5? Yeah. So that, very good question. And, uh, you know, for those of you interested in LIRATS, uh, I know that in this session we, have, we don't have much time, but the manual is very detailed and it would provide all these answers in a more detailed way that I can. But to answer your question, so tumor in vein is in the diagnostic tree. And so when you are confident in the diagnosis of tumor in vein, you assign that observation the category TIV. You can go a step further to provide information to the to your clinical team. So if you think that the tumor in vein is in continuity with a mass that has LIRATS 5 features, then you can say LIRATS TIV most likely, I forgot the exact terminology the LIRATS use, but like you suggested that, that comes from hepatocellular carcinoma. But remember that a good portion of tumor in vein in cirrhosis is caused by malignancy that, that is not about solar carcinoma. And so you, if you think the LIRATS TIV is next to a remanence lesion, you can mention that. You can say there is tumor in vein, but this is actually in continuity with a lesion that I believe is malignant, but that's not the imaging features that are typical for a solar carcinoma. Okay. Right, so moving along uh, LIRADS, uh, just a couple more questions on LIRADS is um, applying ancillary findings to all lesions. Do we need to do that to, do we need to apply ancillary findings to all lesions? Uh, another very good question. You, you probably don't. Uh, um, 
you know, it's arguable um, if, uh, if you need to move a lattice two to a lattice one category or a lattice three to a lattice two category. Um, some of that could be, could be avoided, of course. And indeed, you know, LIRATS, one thing that I forgot to mention in my lecture, it's a living document, right? Like pirates were prostate, right? Uh, um, so the version that we are working on right now, that we use in the, in the practice right now, which is version 2018, is not the last version. The group is already working on the next version, which will come out next year or maybe at the end of this year. Um, and so in the new version, actually the number of ancillary features will be decreased and uh, based on uh, the literature that we accumulated in this period of time. I find it particularly helpful for LIRAT3 observations. LIRAT3 are right in the middle, right? You give like an indeterminate uh, probability of cancer, which, you know, of course it's helpful, but it's always, more helpful to the clinical team to, to really know, I mean, what you're feeling about that patient. You feel like it's more or less likely to be cancer. And so I find it particularly helpful in LIRATS3 observation to either upgrade it to a LIRATS4 or to downgrade it to a LIRATS2. I show you an example on the slides of a LIRATS3 that we upgraded to a 4 using the hypointensity on hepatobiliary phase images. An opposite example could be a LIRATS3 lesion that is stable for two years, and then we downgrade that to a lattice two, and providing, you know, an information that you are not that concerned about that lesion, and that may change the interval time in um, of of the imaging follow up. Okay. So I think we're down to almost a minute. I don't know if we're allowed to go over now. We just have a few questions left. There's one question on um, Conscient has ultrasound in LIRES and how that's done. I don't know if you have time to answer that question or. Oh, that's, that's, a, that's a big one. Uh, it's done and that's the good thing. And that's the positive thing. And uh, we do have a specific algorithm. And actually, again, the I'm sorry, we don't have time to go into detail and, and I'm certainly not an expert in contrast and ultrasound, but the, the manual has a very well written and detailed, even on how to do it. And I would recommend you to, to download it. Okay. And uh, the rest of will hopefully just be quick, quick, quick questions. Can we have liver cirrhosis with increased liver size? Yes, yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, you can. Um, the theology typically associated with that is uh, PBC, um, but but certainly yes. Yeah, and what's your experience in patients with advanced cirrhosis but no signs of hyper portal hypertension? Uh, you know, it's again uh, not necessarily you have portal hypertension when you have cirrhosis, um, and not necessarily what we see on imaging are all the manifestations of portal hypertension, but um, I, you, it's important for sure that when reporting a, the imaging study of a patient with cirrhosis, we mention if there are or there are not uh, imaging features of, of portal hypertension. Okay, and that leads to the last question. What percentage is liver cirrhosis occurs with portal hypertension? And can we diagnose portal hypertension just based on liver cirrhosis and spinal megaly? You can certainly suggest it. Um, uh, certainly the presence of splenomegaly and a number of other features uh, such as protosystemic venous collateral suggest the presence of portable hypertension. Um, I'm not sure if this answers the question. There, there are also, of course, manifestations of portal hypertension without cirrhosis, but I think we are moving into a, a larger chapter here that we may not have time to fully discuss here. Okay, that's great. Sorry for that. um, yeah, so we're, our hour is up, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ferlin, for an amazing lecture. A um, lot of um, great content in there, and I'm sure we all learned a lot. And thank you, everyone, for attending. We had an amazing turnout from around the world. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, I guess we'll sign off now because we're a little bit over time. So <laughs> thank you. Thank yeah, you, Dr. Chang, and everybody at the Up for the World team. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Bye, everyone.